All right, I'll just use this mic, that's fine, yeah. Thanks very much. All right, so let me give this last talk here, and I wanna tell you about how do we uh, eliminate bugs to build really secure systems using this idea of hardware security modules and uh, the approach of formal verification. So the problem that I'll be trying to address in this talk is a little bit different from the cryptographic problems that we've been looking at before. And in particular, I wanna understand how do we build secure computers that actually compute the stuff, that actually implement the math that is gonna give us some nice security properties. And where security often fails these days is that we have very complicated systems, so you have millions of lines of code on your computers, phones, servers, etc., and that means that you also have thousands of bugs to go along with that large amount of code. And uh, as we've learned, these bugs can be found by adversaries and exploited to do all kinds of damage to our computers from stealing data, installing malware or keyloggers, impersonating us, and so on. So a powerful idea for dealing with this huge complexity of software on our computers is to use this idea of hardware security modules, or HSMs for short. And the idea is to factor out the key security operations that you care about on your computer system and run them on a separate device. And this idea is gonna allow us to provide strong security guarantees even if the host machine is compromised. So the diagram you see on the right here is a typical example you've probably encountered using one of these uh, you know, USB security keys that you plug into your computer. The USB security key on the right has a secret key that it can use in, as part of some cryptographic protocol to authenticate you to a server over the internet. And it's plugged into your computer, but the computer doesn't have access to the key directly. All the computer can do is ask this little device to please sign my login request on behalf of the user. So the computer can do something as you, but worst case, it'll never get your signing key. If you unplug your key, that's it. You've taken the key with you. And this idea shows up in a bunch of cases in computer systems. So the simplest example you've probably all used is this two-factor authentication using a USB security key. The same idea shows up in your smartphone where iPhones and Android phones have a separate chip inside of them called a security enclave that manages the unlocking on your, of your device so that even if uh, there's bugs in the Android operating system itself, they will not lead to your iPhone being unlocked without supplying the right pin code. So, this HSM is the essence of our security, and we'd like to figure out how to actually make it so, because the security of our entire computer system is now anchored in this one little device. And making this HSM secure is potentially more tractable because it's much less complicated, so orders of magnitude less code and fewer bugs, but it's also a very juicy target for attackers to uh, uh, try to break into because it has all of our keys. So the goal of the work I'm going to talk about here is how do we guarantee the security of these hardware security modules that are the basis of security for a number of systems. And if we can do this, this is a big opportunity because it's going to allow us to verify or make sure this one little device is secure and have a huge impact on the security of the overall system. And this is gonna be true despite a fairly strong threat model. So a bunch of different attacks fall under this uh, umbrella. So basically any adversary that can gain control of my host machine and has full control to twiddle the like USB wires going into my hardware security module in any way you want, uh, we're gonna try to prove that we'll still be secure regardless of what, what's going on there. About the only thing that we sort of rule out is an adversary physically taking that HSM and like breaking it open and extracting the key physically with a hammer or a oscilloscope or even a fancier machine. So what do people do today to try to build secure HSMs? The standard sort of state of the art techniques is uh, testing and fuzzing. So testing, uh, you've all done, uh, you manually write test cases and make sure that the device does the right thing on specific inputs. And fuzzing is sort of an extended version of that where you use some automated uh, random input generation to test whether the system behaves correctly for all kinds of random inputs. And these have been very fruitful techniques. So many real systems use them and they find bugs, but they're not complete in the sense that they can't guarantee that there's no more bugs to be found. And in fact, you typically run a fuzzer forever and it keeps finding more and more bugs, maybe slowly decaying the rate. And uh, what we see is that 
As a result, adversaries keep finding bugs in real hardware security modules. And they range from bugs in hardware, where the CPU implementation itself might be slightly incorrect that leads to a security problem, to all kinds of software issues that come up, sort of mundane buffer overflows, logic errors, etc., And even subtle issues that uh, we talk about called timing channels. And these are particularly subtle and tricky to get right, in the context of these hardware security modules that I've uh, been talking about. And let me just give you an example to illustrate what I mean by a timing channel. So here we have some code on the left that you might imagine running inside of one of these HSMs that checks a password. And it has the reference password that's the right one and a guess that you supply. And it checks whether it's correct by checking whether every byte of the password is right in a loop. And this is a problematic implementation because this allows the adversary to very quickly guess the password by guessing one byte at a time. And the insight that allows this is that if an adversary can try all the passwords that start with A, B, C, D, and so on, at one of them, the execution of this check password function will take slightly longer because the for loop goes on to the next byte. And if the adversary observes that, ah, ah, that input took slightly more cycles, then it knows, oh, well, that byte was right. Let me move on and guess the next byte now. And this turns what should have been an attack that requires 26 to the n guesses for an English alphabet password to a 26 times n uh, input attack. And these timing attacks are real and quite important in this HSM setting where we assume that my USB security key is directly plugged into this compromised computer the compromised computer can very precisely measure the timing of how many cycles exactly it takes this device to respond. And at the same time, this stuff is extremely tricky to reason about. This is not something that typically we worry about when writing software. And even the underlying hardware makes it hard because even the multiply instruction, that's sort of the basis of you know, quite a bit of stuff you'd write, uh, takes different number of cycles. So if you multiply by 0 and 1 on modern CPUs, that is very fast. If you multiply by 23, that is much slower, noticeably so. Uh, how do you write sort of secure software in this setting? Yeah? That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. So, so, so uh, the kinds of things that are in, in our threat model is basically everything that's on these pins. Like wh whatever you can do digitally on these wires, that's what we worry about. So what we'd like to do is convince ourselves that if I give you arbitrary access to my those like four traces on this device, nothing bad can happen. Now, if you're like, you know, you have a RF antenna on this or irradiate the stick in a microwave, okay, that's a different story. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and the, the reason we care about this particular threat model is this corresponds to people compromising your computer. So it's not so much that I'm sitting next to Vinod and Vinod is like really sneaky and trying to do something. It's that I plug my device into another good device, but it's been compromised. And uh, the person, the attacker that's compromised my laptop remotely can do whatever it wants on the computer, but can't like all of a sudden make an oscilloscope appear out of thin air. Yeah. So the approach we're gonna try to use to tackle this problem is this idea of formal verification, uh, where uh, this is gonna be sort of a mechanized version of what uh, Yael was talking about, of checking a proof of some sort. And uh, in here, verification revolves around a, a verification tool that's basically a proof checker of sorts, and it has three inputs. You feed in the middle the actual implementation of the system you want to check something about, like the source code of the code running on my uh, HSM or something like this. And I also feed in a specification that describes what should this code do? What, what do I expect is the correct thing? And uh, as a result also, what is incorrect? And then also I feed in some kind of a proof that convinces this verification tool, this checker, that, oh yeah, that, that implementation really does meet the specification, then I can be happy with that. And what this verification tool is gonna do is ensure that this implementation perfectly meets the spec. So, for any possible input, anything that the adversary can do on those wires or if, if any inputs they can feed into my functions, it'll match the spec. And if the spec is what you wanted, then the implementation is also what you wanted. Now, of course, the spec has to be suitably small that you convince yourself it's right, but it's a powerful idea to convince yourself of the correctness of some complicated implementation. 
I'm not gonna get into too many details of how this works under the covers, what's going on is that this verification tool is some kind of a proof checker that has a notion of logic and it has a abstract model of how this computer is gonna execute. So it understands how software executes or how hardware executes, something along these lines. And then it checks mathematical statements about those execution models that allows us to reason about all possible inputs. This is a very active area of research now and there are some initial success stories that you'll hear about in the next session which is gonna have quite a bit of talks focused on verification, uh, but in this talk I'll tell you about one project we've done in this space, a system called Knox that allows us to indeed verify these hardware security modules and uh, sort of two interesting salient points here is that in this Knox project we're verifying the full stack of what's going on on that device. So the hardware, the software, and sort of everything in between, and all the connections between them, uh, they're verified as a single device, so it's not subject to assumptions about what a CPU does, it's really Ethereum about the four wires sticking out of my device, roughly speaking. And the other thing that's cool is that the specification that we're gonna have is gonna cover all correctness and security properties, including sort of hardware, software, and timing channel uh, correctness and security as well. So you will see that definition shortly. So in the rest of the talk, I'll mostly spend my time describing to you what it means to define security in the setting even. So it turns out that even defining what does it mean for an implementation to meet a specification of this kind and provide security is a little bit tricky. And that's one of the key ideas that we've been able to figure out here. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the framework that we've built that actually does this checking and the three case studies that we've built of realistic looking HSMs and um, sort of specifications we've proven on them and the kinds of bugs it allows us to find. And the cool idea to reiterate is that this allowed us to find all kinds of subtle details at all layers of the stack in these three case studies without having to explicitly enumerate like, well, do I have this kind of a bug and that kind of a bug? It all stems from a very simple spec. So, by the way, feel free to ask questions even if you're not Vinod, but yeah, everyone else uh, as well. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as a running example of the uh, sort of kind of specification I'm looking at, uh, consider this uh, example of a pin protected backup HSM. So you can think of this as the core of your phone that's going to unlock your phone if you enter the right pin code into it. So what's going on is that it has a function to store a new secret uh, with a pin code and it also has a way to retrieve your key out of the uh, secure element if you supply the right pin guess. And in order to provide strong security guarantees here, uh, it's important to make sure you can't keep guessing pin codes, so you only get 10 guesses to uh, try to guess the pin. So this spec is a fairly high level functional spec in some Python pseudocode style and it just describes what do these two functions do. If you store, you update the secret and the pin in place, and if you retrieve, you get 10 attempts to get it right, otherwise you will not be able to guess anymore. Uh, and it has no notion of timing, and uh, this is a very sort of nice description of what we'd like to get out of this kind of a device, but at the implementation level, things are much more complicated and messy, so we have everything from the hardware, sort of shown in this diagram on the right, where we have the CPU and some code that runs on top of the CPU, peripheral devices, various kinds of memory for code storage, for heap memory, for persistence, uh, external pins going on and so on. And the interface looks quite different, so it's really these like four wires sticking out of the bottom of the diagram that correspond to uh, the data coming in and out of the device. And the interface were, is really quite low level. We're talking about sort of timing diagrams of the logic levels of these wires at various points in time as the clock ticks. So how do we connect uh, these two things? So I, ha I showed you this very nice picture of a functional spec of what this HSM should provide, store and retrieve, and this extremely detailed timing diagram of the wires sticking out of it. So we'd really like two things out of a correctness or uh, sort of a definition here. One is that we'd like it to be the case that the implementation actually meets the spec, that you can call those two functions somehow. But also we'd like a security or a non-leakage property that we wanna convince ourselves that not only can you implement those two functions, but there's nothing more you can do. You can only do those two functions. So for example, there's no leakage of the kind of timing channel I showed before where it takes a different number of cycles whether the first digit of your pin is right or the second digit is right. 
So how do we sort of define this to be our correctness condition? So what we do is we introduce an, an notion of information preserving refinement, which is gonna define what does it mean for a implementation to meet a spec. And we're gonna define it in a cryptographic inspired notion as uh, some, some kind of indistinguishability or equivalence between a real world on one side and an ideal world on the other side. So on the left here, we have the real world with all its messy details of the physical implementation and all the sort of the timing diagrams. And on the right is the nice Python-esque spec that we'd like to uh, say, oh, well, that's the same thing. You can sort of treat them as one another. This is gonna be sort of inspired by how you know, we formalize zero knowledge uh, security in, in the cryptography world. And one challenge, of course, is that these are just not the same thing, right? Like you can tell, one has a function, the other has a timing diagram. What does it even mean for them to be equivalent? So in order to try to address this, we introduce this notion of an adapter that takes one form of interface and turns it into the other. And in one direction, it is this notion of a driver that I'll talk about in a second that turns a physical implementation into a functional abstract one. And on the right side, we have this notion of an emulator that takes an abstract uh, functional specification and then turns it into a timing diagram, it, like simulates what would a circuit do at a cycle level accurate uh, representation. So let's talk about these two components. Uh, or I guess what I should say, like what we, once we introduce these two components, now the interfaces look similar. Now we could talk about, well, are they equivalent or not? So what do these adapters look like? On one side, we have the driver, and the job of the driver is to basically tell us if I wanna implement those two operations, store and retrieve, how should I drive the signals? What, what, how do I poke the wires to do a store operation, and how do I poke the wires to do a retrieve operation? This is kind of like a device driver, an operating system. I wanna send a packet, I gotta tell it how do I poke the network card to cause those packets to go out over the network. And this is gonna be a trusted part of our specification because it describes how should a well-meaning user correctly use the device. So here's some sort of pseudocode on the right that defines how you might poke the pins of this HSM that we've been talking about in order to implement the store operation, for example. So a question? Um, I, I would say anyway that I think of some sort of hardware emulator, software. So could you say that the result is actually like a uh, hardware evaluation of a generic emulator with respect to a specific so, so I'll tell you how these emulators are constructed in just a second, but roughly speaking, it's, it's like a slightly hacked up version of the real implementation that just doesn't have the secrets inside of it and makes some Oracle calls to this functional spec under the covers to get access to data that it doesn't otherwise have. Um, so it's not a simulator in the sense of like a very log simulator. Uh, it's like a sim... Uh, the, the way we typically construct them is we sort of take the real implementation and we run it, and at some point we realize, oh, we don't have the secret key in memory because we're just an emulator, we don't have the real stuff. So at some point we have to sort of shell out and make this call to the uh, spec and say, well, please do the, pretend like we did the retrieve operation, for example, give me the answer. And then you sort of stick it in memory and keep running, and th that's how we emulate the, th the cycle level behavior. Adam? Uh, yeah, so we have some non-determinism here, so like this wait until clear to send is some non-determinism in the driver that says, well, send one byte, and then wait until the HSM tells you, I got it, send me the next one, and then you send another one. So this driver really describes how you should sort of generically uh, drive this uh, HSM device to achieve your goal, and this is... Yeah, so this driver is uh, meant to be sort of half a model almost of, uh, it, it should describe all the drivers that are valid. So it should have the most, no, it, it should be a superset of the driver that you'll en end up implementing concretely. It might have some non-determinism that you have to have because that's part of the protocol. It might also have some non-determinism that is just an implementer's choice, like the Linux driver will do one thing, the Mac OS driver will do something else. All right, so that's one kind of a translator, uh, uh, translating the wire level thing and providing an abstract function spec on top of it. The, yeah. That's right, so a driver sort of turns a spec 
operation into an implementation operation, indeed. So it's like a piece of code here that uh, goes between the, you know, the, that function world and a wire world, timing diagram world. But it is sort of trusted implementation. That's right, yeah. So the, 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 that's right, yeah. The driver is going to be trusted or important to understand and convince yourself that's what you meant. The implementation isn't going to be trusted at all. And this emulator is going to be another kind of a transformer that's not going to be trusted at all. It's just the only thing that matters is that it exists. So the job of the emulator is to go the other way. So if you have a black box that has those two function calls that are just abstract things, I want to reconstruct what should the timing diagram have looked like, except the simulator doesn't have access to your secrets. It's a sort of a purely functional emulator, and its job is to sort of synthesize, well, you know, on clock cycle five, this line will go high, then on clock cycle one million, this will go low, and, and so on. This is like a simulator of the dark web. Exactly, yeah, so it's very crypto-inspired. And uh, the way we typically construct this thing is that we're gonna uh, take a real implementation uh, of the thing. Uh, it's not gonna have the secrets in it because it's not allowed to, but then we'll sort of <laughs> introduce a breakpoint and say, oh, well, at cycle one million and 55, stop, call the functional spec, get the answer, and put it in this register, and then you can continue running. And that's uh, there to convince ourselves, or as, like, as part of the proof to convince anyone, that yes, it's possible to reconstruct perfectly the timing sequence just by having access to the functional interface. And that is an argument that all the information derivable in terms of the low-level timing is accessible from the functional API. So, for example, if our implementation of this pin uh, HSM had some timing difference where like in the top diagram you did a retrieve with all zeros, it had one timing diagram, in the bottom you did a retrieve with a different incorrect pin, guess one, two, three, four, five, well, there would be no way to construct an emulator that could reproduce this timing difference because as far as the interface is concerned, all you could do is call retrieve and in both cases you'll get the answer saying, no, that's the wrong guess. So there will be no way for the emulator to match this buggy timing diagram. And as a result, the fact that an emulator doesn't exist tells you that, yeah, this is not actually secure. And as I mentioned a couple of times already, yeah, the, the way we construct this is basically just a copy of the real circuit with strategically placed calls to this ideal specification. So why is this definition cool? Yeah, let me take a question first, yeah. So the functional interface takes no time to respond. In fact, it's, it has no timing notion whatsoever. So you can just call it whenever inside of like one clock cycle of your simulator. Um, you can call it some number of times. Uh, you don't have to sort of use up cycles to call it. You can just sort of say, ah, oh, you know, I want the answer to retrieve of 22. And the answer is so. I can just plug it into my register somewhere. Uh, yeah. So the really nice thing about this IPR property is it allows us to sort of transfer whatever nice properties we like about the spec to be properties of the implementation. So you can look at the spec on the right, it's only sort of 10 plus or minus lines of code, and we can look at it and say, well, it only reveals the secret if the right pin is supplied. And it correctly enforces, you can only have at most 10 guesses. And if you store a new secret, it'll really forget the old one and all kinds of good stuff. And all these properties that are true about these 10 lines of code are going to be now true about those thousands of lines of hardware and software and all this messy stuff, including timing channels and, and so on. So this is sort of the power of having a good, you know, strong definition that carries along the simple spec to that implementation. And we've implemented this notion in a tool called Knox. It's uh, roughly 3,000 lines of code on top of a uh, open source framework called Rosette. And the way it works is we have a very low level model that just understands how to execute circuits, one cycle by cycle, cycle, cycle level. And we implement what's called symbolic execution of the entire sort of circuit implementation of the hardware described as Verilog, plus all the software running on top of it and everything uh, on top of this digital circuit model. And the developer has to supply a few hints. They're not trusted. They can't really break your proof, but they help the proof go through faster. And on top of this, we've built uh, three case studies that I want to tell you about just to give you some flavor of what is possible to achieve with verification. 
So the case studies we've built are realistic enough in the sense that they run on top of a risk v CPU that we got off the shelf from GitHub. Um, they have a cryptographic accelerators in them, devices and so on. So there's thousands of lines of hardware description in these HSMs that we've built. There's um, some control logic written in C and assembly, device drivers, cryptographic code, et cetera. And the really cool thing is the specs are pretty short. So the specs are tens of lines of code, uh, despite the fact that the implementation is much more complicated. And the proof on the right-hand side is uh, manageable, not, not, not gigantic at least. So what are these case studies? Let me tell you about the first one. The first one is a fairly simple thing. Uh, it's a HSM that hashes your password with some secret that's only stored inside the HSM. The reason this is useful is if, if you have a server that's storing lots of people's passwords, you might wanna hash your passwords in a way that an attacker cannot invert them easily, and having this uh, HSM that stores a secret inside of it turns out to be really helpful. And the cool thing is the spec here is five lines. Very simple, plus some boilerplate for defining what a hash function even is. Uh, so it's a very simple spec, you convince yourself it's right, and when we did the proof, we found actually quite a surprising set of bugs in both the hardware and the software. One example was that when we did the proof, we realized that some registers were uninitialized. So when you first powered off the HSM, uh, depending on what state it was in randomly, you might be executing some random command that you weren't expecting. Uh, so that's a bug you might not find every time because it's somewhat random depending on how your uninitialized value shows up at power up time. There was also some timing differences uh, based on how we stored the secret in flash or in persistent memory. So depending on where we stored it, if you sort of stored a, a bunch of previous secrets before, it might take a different number of cycles. So that we had to fix that to make the definition go through. So this really shows that like a five line spec forces all these subtle details to be fixed. Another example is a time-based one-time password implementation or TOTP. These are the kinds of things that you have on your phone that generate six digit you know, two-factor authentication codes. And the spec, again, is extremely simple, 10 lines of code, plus some you know, boilerplate for defining a hash function. And we found a pretty subtle uh, bug where when we were storing secrets to flash or persistent storage, we did it in the wrong order. So if we crashed at just the wrong cycle, you could unintentionally reveal the contents of some previous secret that you were storing in flash that you shouldn't have been. And we had some timing differences where we were supposed to reveal the six digit code that is sort of in the spec, but we did it with a module operator. And that turned out to be variable time depending on what other bits are present in the value. So we actually had to implement a constant time modulo implementation to precisely meet the spec. Uh, yeah. So the hardware spec is part of the implementation. So hardware is implementation for us. So uh, as I mentioned before, our tool runs at the level of digital circuits. So that's the implementation language, it's gates. And software isn't even a first order thing in our model. Software just happens to be the initial contents of your read-only memory when the circuit starts running. So for us, the thing we worry about is things that are circuits. And then we prove that this circuit, including the implementation of that hardware. So when I, on this slide, was talking about the hardware, this is like the 3,000 lines of hardware code. That's an implementation of a RISC-V CPU. And then we treat that as the implementation for which we prove this theorem. Uh, we axiomatize the behavior of, yeah, sort of uh, D, uh, uh, SRAM and FRAM, indeed, yeah. So th th those kinds of things we don't uh, implement as circuit level, you know, Primitives, so yeah, combinational logic, I guess, is, and, and yeah. All right, so the other case study I was describing here, we have some timing difference here. Maybe the most interesting one is this case uh, running example I've been showing you with this pin protected uh, HSM, where again, the spec is very short, 32 lines of code to prove that you will enforce the pin guesses correctly. And it found a really subtle bug that turned out to be a bug both in our implementation and in some real open source devices that get this wrong. And this is a, like a really subtle thing where you can bypass the guess limit by precisely crashing the HSM at a well-defined point. So let me describe how this works. So here is roughly the code, the implementation of retrieve. Uh, it uh, takes a guess does a constant time compare, so we fix that bug, so we're carefully comparing the pin with the real guess, uh, with the real reference pin in a constant amount of time, and then if the check fails, then we increment the bad guess count and then return an error, 
And if the check succeeds, if we got the right pin, then we're gonna zero out the gas counter and then, okay, reveal the secret or unlock the phone or whatever. And on the left is shown a timing diagram of how this code actually runs. And just as so happens, this code is compiled by the compiler in a way where if you supply the right guess, it'll zero out the bad guess counter quickly. And if you take the wrong guess, just because of the branches and the code layout, it'll take a few more cycles before you increment the bad guess counter. And what an adversary can do now is it can crash the device at exactly that number of cycles. Now, this doesn't tell the adversary anything yet. But also, nothing, nothing really interesting has happened on the device either until you've supplied the right guess. So here's what an adversary can do. It can supply the guess all zeros, run for that many cycles, and crash. If the guess was right, it'll clear out the bad guess counter. If the guess was wrong, it will not increment the bad guess counter. Then you guess 0001, 0002. And you can keep doing this. And if you try all the pins, it will not increment, it'll never increment the bad guess counter, and one of them will clear it to zero. And this way you can reset this counter to zero by just running the device for 10,000 iterations. You know, these are computers, these are fast. And then you can try some real guesses. Try nine. And then you do this again to reset to zero. Then you do another nine, and then you reset it to zero. Extremely subtle stuff. We were surprised, we were debugging this ourselves, like, why isn't the proof going through? Turns out this is a really subtle issue. And uh, this shows up in real code. So the solo key is a pretty popular open source implementation of this stuff. Has exactly the same code pattern where they uh, have a timing difference between zeroing this out and incrementing the bad guess counter. Some things actually get this right, so the, another Im popular implementation called OpenSK gets this code right, but this really highlights the subtlety and the importance of really verifying this down to the last uh, cycle effectively. Um, so in conclusion, I told you that uh, about this idea of HSM seems pretty powerful and verifying them has a huge opportunity to have a serious impact on security of real systems. And the sort of one contribution we had here is in defining this notion of information preserving refinement that allows us to connect this cycle level implementation to a much higher level functional spec and say what does it mean for the two of them to reveal the equivalent information. And I showed you a couple of case studies that we've done showing that this seems to actually work pretty well for a variety of HSMs that you might care about in practice. And we have some ongoing research I'm happy to talk to you about afterwards during lunch break on how to make this easier to apply to new software so that a developer of an HSM doesn't have to be a hardware verification expert quite as much. Thanks very much.